Greetings and welcome. We are in junior English, and our expectation now for the next few minutes is to spend some time talking about yellow wallpaper. Now, I'm assuming already that you have looked somewhat closely at this text, and especially you've looked at the information on 766 to 767, the preparing to read pages. That tells you a little bit about Gilman and the story itself. Now, let's talk about the story yellow wallpaper. I've already said to you that the yellow wallpaper is a pivotal moment in the history of feminist thought. When this story is first published, it is received by the male critiquers, you know those guys that do thumbs up or thumbs down, that kind of thing, and collectively they all say the same thing. This is a story that you would expect if you let a woman write a story. Remember when Gilman writes the story, there haven't been a lot of women yet who have been really professional writers. Women are looked down on, in fact, if they call themselves artists. And so when Gilman writes this story, it's going to be already controversial because she's a woman. She says to male readers, yeah, you missed it. You need to go back and read the story a second time. And when those men went back and read the story a second time, they immediately were deeply offended by the story. It upset them. The obvious question for us is, what is it that happened in their second reading of the story, and why is it that they got so upset? We'll start there. But the place that we've got to really begin is to understand the distinction between a literal reading of a text and a metaphoric or symbolic reading of a text. So let's put this in our notes real quickly. A literal reading of a text is what? It says about the events that happen in the story. What? They literally happen. They literally happen. That is to say, you read the text, and whatever is being expressed, you're supposed to understand happening literally. There is a second, however, way to read a text. And we call it symbolic or metaphoric. Now, Ms. Cottrell, when we talk about a symbolic reading of a text, what do we mean by that then? Yeah, that is to say, we do not read the text as literal, but rather as symbolic or metaphoric. In other words, the events that are described are intended to explain something else. Gilman argued this story can be read at the literal level, and it presents a woman losing her mind, going crazy. But there is a second reading of this text that is metaphoric. And that will mean all of the elements of the story then have a second and sometimes even a tertiary reading, meaning, understanding. That metaphoric reading is what male readers collectively begin to understand and then that upset them. Let's go back to the end of the story because that's where we have to spend our time and make sure we understand, first of all, literally what's happening, and then second of all, metaphorically or symbolically what's happening. Now, where, let me ask a series of questions, you're just going to jot down information in, in, in your notes. Where are they? Where, where are they? They're in a mansion, in a house, a big mansion. Now, is this their home? It's not their home. Why are they there? Why are they there? Did you get a sense of why they're there? Right. In Gilman's day, women were often told that they suffered from high amounts of stress and anxiety. The answer to that stress and anxiety, they were told by doctors, was they needed to go to the country where it was really quiet and they needed to sit and do absolutely nothing for long periods of time. I mean months of time. And when women started to feel upset about, you know, doing nothing, they were often prescribed certain kinds of drugs. Opium is a powerful drug, very addictive drug. It puts you in a completely drunken stupor state. You don't even know where you are. You don't even oftentimes know who you are, and it's highly addictive drug, leading to the deaths of a lot of women during Gilman's day. Now this woman is being taken to the country house where she can rehabilitate. What's wrong with her? What's wrong with her? No, when she goes, she's not crazy, not at all. 
Christ. Wait a minute. Who's our God? Well, who is he? Though? What's he do? He's a, he's a doctor. That's significant. He's a doctor. He keeps telling her she needs to stop doing anything that would cause greater stress because it's bad for her nerves. Too much anxiety. For example, what are some of the things she's told she cannot do by her husband doctor? Now that's ironic. Let's put it in our notes. She's told no writing. Well, now wait a minute. What are we reading? Her story. We're, writing. Uh, we're not reading a story written by John. This is the professional prescription and diagnosis of my, of my wife's slipping into insanity. Let me tell you how it happened. That's not what we're reading. Wait a minute. For your notes, POV for us often means points of validation, but POV can also mean what when we're talking about the study of a story? Does anybody know? Point of, point of view. Now, what does that mean, point of view? What does that mean? When you have to write your young author story, you're going to have to decide right away, early on, who will tell this story. There's basically two ways to tell a story. One way to tell a story is what we call the first person point of view. What does that mean? The person in the story is telling the story. So what pronoun gets used? Me. I, me, right? A second kind of story is what we'll call third person perspective. That is an individual outside of the story telling the events of the story. What kind of point of view is this story? It is first person. Who's writing it? Wait a minute. I thought she was told not to write. Ah, oh, right away, Mr. Mortimer, we want to make an important observation here. This is, by definition, a story written by a woman who is told by her husband, doctor, she's not supposed to be writing. But wait a minute. This is the story written by a woman who's supposed to also be crazy. But wait a minute. Let's define what we mean by crazy. The one thing about crazy people is that they don't know they're crazy. Think about that. So for example, if you say, I, I, I'm going nuts or I'm going crazy, that's a sure sign that you're not crazy. Crazy people think everybody else crazy. But they themselves, right? We are expected to believe, if we read this story literally, that you've got a crazy woman writing about going crazy. Oh yeah. And there's this other strange thing where we're supposed to accept the fact that while she's doing things, she's writing about doing them in the present moment. Now, we have two ways in terms of tense to tell a story. We can talk about it in the past tense, right? Or we can talk about it in the present tense. Over and over again in the story, there's a shift in tenses. We want to pay particularly close attention to this at the end of the story. Are you ready for this? It's the key that unlocks the story. Once you begin to realize... The tense shifts have a lot to do with the fact that this story is going to be read, not literally, but metaphorically or symbolically. Once you realize that, then you can begin to understand, whoa, 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 what's actually being said or, said or going on in this story? For example, if you read this story literally, you are expected to believe that while she's trying to move the bed, what does she say about the bed? She's in a special room in this, in this house, by the way. It's an interesting room. What's on the windows? How come? Is that so nobody can get in or can nobody can get out? Well, we know it isn't so nobody can get in because they're on what? They're on the second floor, upper floor of the mansion, right? The bars on the window are to keep people from getting out. Wait a minute. What else do we know about this room? What about the bed? It's nailed, down. nailed to the floor. We're expected to believe that while she's trying to move the bed, she will write in present tense, I am moving the bed and it won't move. It's as if we're expected to believe that she's writing the story while she's trying to move the bed. Well, obviously, we recognize this can't be done, right? Finally, let's point out, crazy people don't write about being crazy, especially in a past tense, right? Especially in a past tense. If she's nuts and she's lost her mind at the end of the story, there is no reason to believe after the fact she would be writing about it. And yet the story will end not in present tense, but in past tense. It will be that shift to past tense that will begin to be the indicator. Something else is going on here. Now, at the end of the story, we've already been dealing for several pages with this strange room and more particularly the wallpaper in this strange room. Two things about it that, may, that are important. First, 
the senses are all heightened around this wallpaper, right? It smells. How's it smell? Yellow. Yeah, it smells gross, doesn't it? it? Smells gross. Also, we're told you, she can see things behind this wallpaper. It starts to move. She doesn't just see anything. What does she see behind the wallpaper? She sees women, right? She sees women. Already, we'll begin to understand this wallpaper can start to represent something that will explain a whole bunch of this story. Got me? Secondly, about the wallpaper. She goes on a mission with the wallpaper. What's the mission? She's going to remove all the wallpaper. Why? Literally, why? What's the point of removing all the wallpaper from the room? That wallpaper's starting to bug her. Right? Isn't it? It's starting to bug her. She says... Her interests are to try to free the women that are stuck behind the wallpaper. Well, now that's kind of interesting. Then we come to the final paragraphs of the story. We'll start on page 782. Hurrah, this is the last day. Are you all reading with me on 782? Hurrah, this is the last day. What tense? So you take a look at it. What tense? This is the last day. What tense? That's present tense. If it was past tense, it would be what? This was the last day, correct? So hurrah, this is the last day, but it's enough. John's to stay in town overnight and won't be out until this evening. Jenny wanted to sleep with me, the sly thing, but I told her that I should undoubtedly rest better for a night all alone. Who's Jenny? John's sister to me. Who is Jenny? Basically her care provider, right? The one who's left to make sure she does not get in any kind of anxiety or stressful activity, right? That was clever for really, I wasn't alone a bit, exclamation mark. By the way, notice all the exclamation marks in this story, all right? Uh, Hernandez, I'll let you shut the lid on it. Uh, um, um, sly thing, but I told her I should undoubtedly rest better for a night all alone. That was clever for really, I wasn't alone a bit. As soon as it was moonlight, here we go, and that poor thing began to crawl and shake the pattern. What poor thing? The, the women, yeah, the woman, the woman behind the wallpaper, right? Notice the word crawl for your notes. The word crawl and the word creep. We want to look very closely at these verbs. I will tell you in advance, there is nothing accidental in this story. Gilman said as much. She told her male critiquers, yeah, you kind of missed it. Go back and read it again. That infuriated them, by the way. Uh, go back and read it again. And when we go back and look at it again, we begin to realize everything has a second meaning. The word crawl or the word creep will also have a second meaning. I got up and ran to help her. I pulled and she shook, I shook and she pulled and before morning we had peeled off yards of that paper. Now we have women helping to free each other. Yes? Keep going. A strip about as high as my head and half around the room. And then when the sun came up, that awful pattern began to laugh at me. I declared I should finish it today. Notice all the exclamation marks, right? We go away tomorrow. By the way, Oz, I'm on page uh, 782. You want to open your hymnal so that you're with me following it. We go away tomorrow and we're moving all my furniture down again to leave things as they were before. Jenny looked at the, at the wall in amazement, but I told her merrily that it didn't, I did it out of spite at, at, at the vicious thing. She laughed and she said she wouldn't mind doing it herself. Interesting little giveaway as well. But I must not get tired how she betrayed herself that time. But I'm here and no person touches this paper but me, not alive. She tried to get me out of the room. It was too patent. But I said it was so quiet and empty and clean now that I believed I would lie down again and sleep all I could. And not to wake me even for dinner, I, I would uh, call when I woke. So now she's gone. What tense? Now she's gone. What tense? Uh, by the way, I was, I'm at line uh, 497 or so. So now she's gone. Yeah. Present tense. We're in present tense. Now she is gone, right? Present tense. We should accept, if you're going to be a literal reader of the story, you have to imagine that right now while she's talking to us, she's writing this, correct? Uh, so now she's gone, and the servants are gone, and the things are gone, and there's nothing left but that great bedstead nailed down with the canvas mattress we found on it. We shall sleep downstairs tonight and take the boat home tomorrow. I quite enjoy the room. Now it is bare again. How those children did tear about here. This bedstead's fairly gnawed. Uh oh, tells us something about the bed. What's, where is she? What kind of room is this room? Keep going. Why is there gnaw marks on the bed posts? It's for insane. There you go. So in other words, as people start to lose their mind, one of the things they start doing is gnawing on things and chewing on things. She will not be the first one to have been locked in this room where they started gnawing on things. 
but I must get to work. That's an interesting insight, get to work. I've locked the door, thrown the key down into the front path. I don't want to go out. I don't want to have anybody come in until John comes. I want to astonish him. Now, that's, if, if you owned this book, you would circle the word astonished, wouldn't you? What does the word astonish mean? If I say I want to astonish Logan, what does that mean? Surprise, Surprise keep going. Amaze. Amaze, keep going. Fascinate, keep going. There's another word that you have missed yet. Shock. That's it, right there. Astonish means to shock, as in to blow out of the water, as in to surprise. That's going to be a huge insight for your notes. Her objective is to shock or to astonish John. Who's John? John is her guy. Also her doctor. I've got a rope up here that even Jenny did not find. If that woman does get out and tries to get away, I can tire. Uh, I can tire. But I forgot I could not reach far without anything to stand on. This bed will not move. Literally, you're supposed to. If you're reading the story, it's a literal story. You're supposed to imagine that she's trying to move the bed while at the same time she's writing, this bed will not move. And in that moment, we realize, yeah, you can't read this story as a literal story. And all of a sudden, those of us who read the story saying, oh, this is just about some crazy whack job that's going nuts, we begin to realize, whoa, 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 there may be something else going on here. And she may, st she may just have gotten me as a reader of this story, if all I think is this is a story about some whack job going crazy. I tried to lift, what tense? Past. All of a sudden we shift to the past tense. I tried to lift and push until it was I was lame. And then I got so angry I bit off a little piece of the corner, but it hurt my teeth. Then I pulled off all the paper I could reach standing on the floor. It sticks horribly and the pattern just enjoys it. All those strangled heads and bulbous eyes and waddling fungus growths just shriek with derision. Who are all those, who are all, who's she talking about? All those women who are behind that wallpaper. And all of a sudden, wait a minute, what's the story title? The yellow, the yellow wallpaper. And all of a sudden, oh, wait. Symbolically, this paper may start to represent something. Namely, what? See, don't say it out loud. Just write it in your notes. What is this wallpaper starting to represent that this woman has decided she's going to tear down off the wall? I'm getting angry enough to do something desperate, to jump out of the window. I'm at the top of 783. Jump out of the window would be admirable exercise, but the bars are too strong even to try. Besides, I wouldn't do it, of course not. I know well enough that a step like that is improper and might be misconstrued. In other words, she says, I, I am always reminding myself I have to behave according to the way culture tells me I'm supposed to behave as a, as a, as a woman. Yeah. I don't like to look out that window even. There are so many of those creeping women, and they creep so fast. I wonder if they all came out of that wallpaper as I did. Wait a minute, came out of the wallpaper? We have another word for the notion of coming out of something. What is that word? You're, you're right, creep will, be, creep will be there. But I'm thinking about another word that's not mentioned in our story. What about, what did, what did Lincoln write? What kind of proclamation? Emancipation proclamation. Emancipate means what? To free. That's absolutely right. To free. Uh, this story began to be read as the great emancipation proclamation, not for slaves, but for who? For women. Let's take a look at why this story might be read that way and why men, male readers, of this story got pretty offended once they began to read this story as its symbolic story and not as a literal story. I'm securely fashioned now by the, by the well-hidden rope, and you can't get me out in the road there. I suppose I'll have to get uh, back behind the pattern when it comes night, and that is hard to go back to what you were before. is hard once you've been freed, right? It's so pleasant to be out in this great room and creep around as I please. I don't want to go outside. I won't, even if Jeannie asked me to. For outside, you have to creep on the ground, and everything is green instead of yellow. But here I can creep smoothly on the floor and my shoulder just fits in that long smooch around the wall so I cannot lose my way. Now the final part of the story. Why, there's John! Notice the exclamation marks now as we finish this story. Why, there's John! It's no use, young man. You can't open it. How he does call and pound. Now he's crying for an axe. It would be a shame to break down that beautiful door. John Deere, said I in the gentlest voice. The key's down by the front steps under a plantain leaf. Wait a minute. How is she speaking to John? John, dear, I said in the gentlest voice. No, no. I'm asking a different question. I'll help you. She speaks to John at this moment, at the end of the story, the way he has spoken to her 
How has he spoken to her for all the story? Like a child. Say it again, Hunter. It's so important. Like a, child. like a child, hasn't he? He's treated her like a child. Oh, you're so silly. You think you're sick. What a silly little girl you are. That's how he's spoken to her. He's treated her as if somehow he is above her. She, right? Notice all of a sudden she starts to speak to him the way he's been speaking to her. Notice again. John Deere, said I in the gentlest voice, the key's down by the front steps under a plant leaf. That silenced him for a few moments. Then he said very quietly indeed, open the door, my darling. I can't, said I. The key's down by the front door under a plant leaf. And then I said it again. Notice she has to keep saying it. It's as if he's too stupid to understand what's going on. And then I said it again, several times, very gently and slowly. You got to talk slow to a man because he's too stupid to understand what's going on. Say it really slow, and maybe they'll figure it out. See, see, how that, see how that's working, right? Okay. So now all of a sudden, notice she's talking to John. She's got to slow it down. She says, I have to keep repeating it. He's too dense to figure out what's going on, right? And said it so often that he had to go and see, and he got it, of course, and he came in. He stopped short by the door. Now, a lot of readers of this story later will point out that when women ask for the right to vote, when women asked for the right for equality of payment for the same job a man would do, there were two questions men kept asking women when they asked for the right to vote, for example. John says both of them. But notice how Gilman writes this, only one with a question mark. Do you see it? But here they are. Take a look at what it is that is said. As he comes through, as he, as he opens the door, he asks, What is the matter? He cried. Right. What are you doing? Now, what are you doing is actually a question, but notice how it's written as an exclamation mark. This is exactly what men were saying to women when they were asking for the right to vote during Gilman's day. What? You want to vote? What's the matter with living the life you live? Where you live in a house and do what you're told to do and shut your mouth and do everything we tell you to do. What's the matter? The second question was a little bit more of an accusation than a question. What are you doing? There were a lot of men who said to women, if you keep pushing this thing about the right to vote, you are going to ruin America. Women shouldn't have the right to vote. They should be stuck home doing what they're told by their husbands or their fathers. What are you doing? But notice the next line. I kept on creeping just the same, and it's right about now, right? That the idea of creeping starts to take on a whole other meaning. What does creep mean secondarily in the story, symbolically in the story? To creep is to what? Oh. Right. To, to, to crawl is the literal meaning. What is creep, though, symbolically? What does it mean? I kept on, well, let's keep reading and you'll figure it out. I kept on reading, uh, creeping just the same. But I looked at him over my shoulder. Now, she's looking at him over her shoulder. Where is he in relationship to her? Is he in front of her or behind her? Yeah. The only way she can look over her shoulder is for him to be behind her. Who's in front? She is. Look at what she says. And, all, and after male readers began to read this story as metaphor or symbol instead of literal, they realized Gilman had got one on them, and it was nasty because the men had missed it the same way John will now miss it. Look at what she says. I've got out at last, said I, in spite of you and Jane. And I pulled off most of the paper so you can't put me back. Now, <clears throat> let's just make sure we understand what is creeping. I've got out at last. She says two things to it. One, escape. I've got out, escape, in spite of you and Jane. Now, your footnote will tell you that if you're working with a little reading of the story, you got a serious problem with the word Jane. It almost looks like a typo because who's the other woman in the story? Jenny, Jenny right? So why, why Jane? But if you're reading the story as symbol, as metaphor, it suddenly dawns on you that if a corpse shows up dead, and they don't know what the name of the male is, they call him what? John Doe. If, he's fe if the corpse is female, what do they call her? Jane. And all of a sudden, we start to realize John and Jane are symbolic stereotypes of male and female. The night they voted for basketball in this town of Worland for girls, more women showed up to say, bad idea than men. Women. There were a lot of women who said, what are you doing to other women asking for the right to vote? 
You're going to ruin our culture. We shouldn't have the right to vote. We're just women. We should just do what we're told to do. And women, like Gilman said, way wrong answer. Go back and look at the line again. I've got out. I, at last, it's been a long time. This has been a long journey to get out from behind the yellow wallpaper. In spite of you and Jane. And I've pulled off most of the paper so you can't put me back. What's the tone of a line like this? What does she say? Two things. I've got out, but what? I ain't going back. I, you can't control me. I ain't going back. You can't put me back even if you wanted to, because I've done tore off all the paper. It's over. And the minute male readers started to realize this, they recognized Gilman is writing a major radical piece of writing. What does this quote-unquote crazy woman say? I'm, I'm out, and I ain't going back. It's over. It's done. We're already out, and there ain't no putting us back. Can you see why... Many, many women who read this story begin to understand the symbolic name and then immediately hit them. This, this story is like a call to women to say, well, what's it say? I'm out and I ain't going back. In spite of you, in spite of Jane or other women, I'm not going back. You cannot put me back where I once was behind the yellow wallpaper controlled. The final line of the story is fascinating. When women, I'm not making this up, when young girls were sent to what was called finishing school, that is to say, to finish them off so that they could be a full woman, one of the things they were taught, not making this up, this is real, one of the things they were taught was how to faint, I kid you not. How You've probably seen it in old movies, where a woman gets ready to faint, and the first thing she does is this. There were signs, indicators, of how you are about to faint. When a woman did this to her head, everyone kind of knew to help her get out of the way, and then you learned literally how to fall. Think about it. If you literally fainted forwards, you could hurt yourself. If you fall completely backwards, you could hurt yourself. In finishing school, they were taught women are very frail creatures. Men like for them to be frail creatures. And believe it or not, men kind of are attracted to a woman who knows how to faint or cry all the time. If you can do both, it's even better. See, some of us today will say, you, or some of you right now are looking at me like, you got to be kidding me. Wait a minute, you're reading the story a hundred years later. Times have changed. But there was a time when it was expected that the man was strong. We'll call him John, because that's the name of the story. And the woman is fragile. weak, fragile. Right? She's the fainter. She's the weak one. And he's the strong. Look at the final line of the story. Now why should that man, uh oh, notice it's not John. Notice it's not my husband. How does she refer to him? That, that man. Now why should that man have fainted? Question mark. But he did. And right across my path by the wall. So I had to creep over him every time exclamation mark. There have been a lot of critiquers of this story that have pointed out the most important element of the story is the very last symbol of the story, an exclamation mark. Notice the question, why should that man have fainted? But he did. And right across my path, so I had to creep over him every time. Now again, if you read this story as literal, this is a story about some loon that's pushing herself around the wall and her husband's fainted and she's got to go over him and over him as she pushes herself around the room. That's a literal reading of the story. But when you read this story as symbolic, whoa, 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 what did you just read? She says, now why should that man have fainted? But he did. And right across my path, so I had to creep over him every time. Every time what? Every time what? Every time a woman leaves, she's going to do it right over the fainted body of a man. It's over. It's done. You won't control us anymore. She says, I'm out. And there ain't no going back. It's over. Notice the switch in the story. We've read 12 pages of a woman who's this fragile, poor little weak thing. And the last lines of the story are, now why should that man have fainted? 
but he did, right across my path, so I had to creep over him every time, exclamation mark. A lot of readers of this story took a second look at the story and went, uh oh, oh. And a lot of female readers of this story went, yeah, yeah, that's it. We do not have to take this anymore. What would happen if we just demanded the right to vote? That is to say, we were going to walk the streets, we're going to get thrown into jail, we will do what it takes. They did. So that now, think about this, we can read a story like this today, have a completely different understanding of this story. It blows our minds that just a few years ago, girls and guys couldn't sit in the same classroom and study together. How come? Because girls weren't guys. It was that simple. We look at it today and go, what? That's completely asinine. Think of the number of girls who graduate from our high school first in a class. It's completely asinine to think girls can't do math, girls can't do science, etc., etc. But that's today. That's a long time after the writing of this story, which in many ways, along with story of an hour and a number of other stories, kind of set the tone, right? Questions, comments? Now, wait a minute.